rains in Gippsland, I hear, Rich. It certainly does today, that's for sure. Rich, I've heard that three guys, one chef and two winemakers, have taken over a restaurant in the area and it's called Hoggett Kitchen. So we should go and visit. I do know that a hoggett is a young lamb. It is a young lamb. Yeah. Well, I thought I was going to trick you with a big <laughs> question. Once we get to Hoggett Kitchen, I'm sure it will get some. All right. We have arrived at our destination. Let's go and see what's happening. Now, Rich, I'm pretty sure they've got vines here as well. Yeah. Look how beautiful this is. It is beautiful. And I think our timing is really good because I think they're harvesting something. Hello, guys. Hi. I'm Karen. Hi, Karen. Bill. Hey, Bill. Richard. Hi, Richard. Richard. Nice to meet you, Sullivan. There you go. Patrick, how are you? Thanks for having us. No okay, problem. I do know, Rich, that we are in the presence of very fine Victorian winemakers, William Downey and Patrick Sullivan. And it's so awesome to be here. You guys are picking. What's happening? Picking first batch of Pinot Noir for 2017. So you both still have your separate labels. What will happen to this Pinot that you're pressing now? Will you separate or...? Well, historically, for both of our labels, have bought grapes from growers. Mm -hmm. We kind of didn't want to do that anymore. We wanted to farm it ourselves. We're not, although we make wine and put our label on it, we're not really that interested in vinification where our interest is in agriculture. So it doesn't make sense to buy grapes. No. So we felt like if we combined our efforts, then some goes to Pat, some goes to me. We might make some wine together. Um, but at least we can farm together yeah. and then decide what to do with the wine. Sounds like a really lovely relationship. Mm. Yeah. yeah, that works well. Like bear good fruit. I think so. <laughs> I think so. That was so nice. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm making a traditional Bolognese style ragu today, so a little red wine wouldn't go astray, if possible. I'll pop in a trip stitch and yeah. we'll grab you one. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. So we'll see you a bit later on for a sample. Can't wait. Thanks, yep. Mark. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks guys. Yeah. Look, it might be four seasons in one day today, but this view is fantastic. Richard, we're going to be making a bolognese. Now, I know that's a recipe that everyone's pretty much familiar with, but I'm a purist when it comes to bolognese. So no mushrooms. No randoms, No yeah. randoms. Yeah, I agree with you. Yeah. No, it, sometimes bolognese can be that dish that people make and then throw everything in that's sort of kicking around the fridge. Yeah, wrong. I say let's take it back to basic. Let's go back to the original Italian ragu. Nice. A la bolognese. Made with pork. We've got the St Bernard's collarbutt, which is pretty much the part of the animal, if you don't yeah, mind, Rich, right, that butt. goes up into yeah. the neck and it's actually a part of the animal that works quite hard, so mm -hmm. it needs a long braise, but it's got rich um, marbling of fat through it, which okay. fat is the flavour yeah. that we're chasing. The first secret to a great bolognese is to start off by caramelising your vegetables. Mm. I always use extra virgin oil, around 150 mils. Seems like a lot, but it's not by the time you cook the bolognese out. So into the pan and follow in with the garlic, onion, and then add the celery and carrot. This will take a little while, around mm. 15 minutes, to caramelise the vegetables down so enough. So bring those sugars out. I've got 800 grams of St Bernard's pork, five centimetre dice, oiled and seasoned up nicely. We're just yep. going to brown them on the griddle top, literally dropping them on. Rich, at home I'd normally do this in a fry pan, but we're at a barbecue, in a vineyard, why not do it on top? Absolutely. So if you're doing them at home, you probably do them in batches. You, so would. you would. So you wouldn't sort of crowd the pan and steam it? Definitely. Yeah. As the vegetables soften, why don't we throw in a bay leaf? Okay. Big one. I yeah. love bay, so two. I could... Two. Two? All right. Actually, just put two sprigs of rosemary in as well, Rich. Yep, now? Yeah. Okay. Looking good. It is looking good. Okay. And we will throw this straight in onto the caramelised vegetables. Very nice. So in with the pork and all the juices. Rich, I'm a big lover of nutmeg mm -hmm. in a bolognese sauce. So what's sauce. that going to do? Well, it's the flavour of nutmeg. Mm. It's just a very subtle hint of spice yep. in the background. Okay. I'll probably put about half this nutmeg in. In with a tablespoon Gorgeous. of tomato paste. A little stir. And we'll follow in 
with some red wine. Now, I'm using the William Downey Pinot Noir. How special <laughs> is that? Around 250 mils. Next in with two tins of Australian-grown Ardmona tomatoes. Underrated Australian tomatoes. They are. Mm. That is a rich, dark, full-flavoured tomato. Next in with a litre of meat stock. Um, I'm using a beef stock here because I'm wanting a real full-bodied flavour in this ragu. We're going to let this ragu tick over for a couple of hours until that pork is deliciously falling apart in the ragu. Um, but I believe there is a wild native garden mm -hmm. somewhere here on the property. Why don't we ask Chef Trevor to take us through? And then we can do a little foraging, maybe. Yeah, that okay. would be good. Right. Let's go. So, Trevor, tell us about Hoggett Kitchen. Well, one of our main things is to have a look at the local region. So we're sourcing a lot of the produce from the region. We write the menu every day, so we pretty much go out, get stuff, come back in. fresh have a look as, at, yeah. exactly, and yeah. in season. Yeah. Yep. And this is right at the back door of the kitchen, your bush garden. Yeah, everything's in season at the moment, so it's fantastic. So, I, don't yeah. even, I don't even know what I'm looking yeah. at, so no, you'll have to see, take me through. Yeah. This is a native pepperberry, so it's quite spicy. Um, great and savoury dishes, meat, yeah. I think we could use some of this on your beef dish. All right, yeah, that's We might have idea. to pick a bit of that, yeah. Rich. Yeah. And no. this plant here... Yeah, it's in flower at the moment, so... Oh! Yeah, it's got such a beautiful fragrance. Yeah. yeah. Ah, lemon myrtle. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> spot on. It's I beautiful. don't think I've ever seen it fresh before. Mm. What's this one? So this is the Warrigal Greens. It's Warrigal Greens. Yeah, native spinach. We are in Warrigal, but it's not named after yeah. Warrigal, so, yeah. yeah, so, yeah. Oh, nicely crunchy. Rich, mm. this would be good. Could go well with radishes. Yeah. Anchovies. Roasted radishes. Mm. With... Sounding great. Yeah. It is, isn't it? Mm. Well, Trevor, from one cook to another, I'm very envious of everything at your fingertips in this region. It's such a beautiful place you have here. We've got to get back to the ragu that I've got ticking away. Yep. And I want to ask you whether I can come back and do a little raid of some berries and some Warrigal greens. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. 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 Thank no you. Worries. Thanks okay. so much. Thank you. Yep. Okay, the ragu is ready. Rich, if you could get some pasta. I've got some beautiful Barilla gluten-free pasta. Thank you. Straight in. So this is the traditional way. You stir your cooked pasta mm -hmm. through your sauce, so the pasta then takes on the flavour of the yeah. ragu. Yeah. Shall we have a little sample? Absolutely. Mm. Mm. Wow. Wow. The flavour's just perfect, isn't it? I think it's one of the best bolognese I think I've had in my life. Really? I do. Wow. Hey, the rich. That's all right. For this sensational bolognese ragu recipe, head to intolerantcooks.com.au and you'll find heaps of other information and all the recipes from other shows. There. I've got some beautiful native pepperberry, which I think is going to go lovely with our seared beef. And I've got some native Warrigal greens. All right, so native pepperberry. So what a great take on having a spice rub, not using black or green, but using these native berries. So it's going to be equal parts salt, equal part berries, I reckon. So I'm going to put about two tablespoons of rock salt. So when I grind it up, it's going to break down the berries. All right, let's have a look at this. Grind away. Grind away. Oh, look. Look at that colour coming through. Rich, that colour is almost like the Pinot Noir grapes. We were just... Mm. The smell is fantastic. Come on, have a... Do that. Oh. Right. It's very... It's, it's peppery and sort of herbal at the same time. That's that right. is perfect. So it's quite a wet... Here we go. It's almost the colour of a black currant, you know. Mm. So a little bit of oil, just so we've got something for the rub to stick to. And now we're just going to rub the actual Cape Grim beef 
in our lovely spice mix. So it may seem like quite a bit of crust on the outside of the eye fillet. We've got around a kilo piece here. Some of it will come off during the cooking process, but we really want that salt and pepper to permeate Absolutely. the flesh of the beef. Okay. So it's a hot barbecue. Let's sear it on the flat plate, Mitch. Okay. So what we'll do is sear the steak on three sides yep. for around three to four minutes on each on, side, on, yep. rotating the beef. And then we'll drop it on top of the pepper berries yep. in the baking tray. Cool. Can you start on the radishes for the roast salad? So you'd like some nice leaves. So take away all the nasty sort of broken bits. Keeping the green bits so you can make those for the salad. Cutting the large ones in half. Cutting the large ones in half. Uh, what else goes in with the radishes? A little bit of fresh thyme. And then it's just a little bit of coconut oil. Right, onto it. Coconut oil. Coconut oil. You know, Rich, I've never roasted a radish before. I've done daikon. Mm. It's like when you roast garlic and it's sharp, when you roast it, it mellows it out a bit. Same with the spiciness of the radish. Mm -hmm. It's yum. Just going to sprinkle this over. OK, let's put the beef into the matador baking tray. All right. Landed. Look at that. It looks really pretty. Yeah. All right, these can go both, both go in at the same time. In the centre there, yours can go at the front. Like that. All right. And lid down. I think halfway through, we should be flipping the eye fillet. OK. What else can I prepare for the salad, Rich? So the salad, the greens of the of the ash, the tops of the radish become the greens of the salad. Okay, well we've got these warrigal greens here too. I yeah. might just pick off the tiny little tender leaves and dress them in a little lemon and extra virgin oil and salt. But if you don't have that, you could actually just use a little bit of silver beet or maybe some spinach and just bulk up the salad that way. Let's have a look at the beef. I reckon it's done, Rich. You reckon it's Should done? Should we have a poke? Have a poke. Okay. That's good. That's, oh. my, that's my pot. OK, I think my radish is ready, Karen. And look at these. See? Yeah. See how they've lost that really bright red colour and turned this awesome rose colour? Yeah. Rich, would you like the leaves down on the platter first? Yes. And now, our hot radishes. So they sort of slightly wilt the leaves. Some always fresh anchovies. They are the quiet hero of this salad because they just add that huge sense of saltiness and I could eat anchovies basically anywhere, anytime, I think. Over the top? Over the top. So we've got some organic pepita seeds here, the black yes. ones, which we've toasted, and there's sunflower seeds. So that's going to just drop over like such. Sunflower seeds. Lovely. And Rich, we've got some lotus green lentils. So that's just adding that extra nutritional element to the salad, which I sort of like. And they've been sprouted. Yeah. It takes a couple of days. They're about they're about four days old. You can actually sprout them to the point where they, you just see the little tail coming out, or you can let them go a little bit longer. I sort of like them a little bit longer. So it's just another nutritional layer to the salad. Um, so now I just want to dress the salad. So there's two things to add. So it's a little bit of extra olive oil. You should just drizzle over the top. Mm -hmm. And a little bit of white balsamic. So you're going to get a little bit of extra sweetness. Which and would be a great contrast, I think, to the combination yeah, yeah. of the anchovies, the radish, and then a touch of sweetness yeah. there, the white and balsamic. And then one little extra thing, because I think you and I always love, which is fresh lemon rind. Ah. Yeah. This salad is exotic. It's got a lot of flavours going on, but I'm understanding how they're all playing together. OK, there we go. Well, here we are. Our beautiful eye fillet from Cape Grim rested for about five minutes. Mm. So, you're the master. How am I going to cut this? Well, against the grain, obviously, slicing. I would say, Rich, yep. get in there and cut slightly on the angle. Yeah. I'll take one piece. You might as well. You want me to cut it? Look well, at that. Well, no, because I, I'm, you're right-handed. I'm left-handed. What are we going to do? I'm going oh. to start at the other end. <laughs> so you might as well just carve now. Really? Yeah. That's the glory, though. Yeah. I really want to know how those pepper berries have influenced the flavour of the beef. And then I would suggest just putting it on the plate here. Yeah. So like, like that? that? Yeah. Okay. Just beautiful. Look at the marbling mm. in that eye fillet. 
Now, would you sort of do a final salt and pepper over the top? Well, because you've done the, the, the salt crust, which yep. has the native pepper berry in it, I would say not, but what it does need, from my point of view, is some extra virgin oil just right. dressed over the top. Dressed over the top. I'll do that. So there we have it, our pepper crusted roasted eye fillet with a radish salad. For this recipe and every other recipe we do on the season, head to intolerantcooks.com.au. And follow us on Facebook and find us on Instagram. Yep, yeah, and let's go and find the guys and have a feast. I'm, I can't wait. You want some? I hope they're still here. I'm going to eat. I'm sure they're still here. Hey. Hey, boys. Hey. How are you going? That's good. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. Well, Rich has just finished his dish. Well, so I've got your barbecued eye fillet with pepper berries and a roast radish salad. Beautiful. Guys, I'm glad you enjoyed the ragu, but oh, you, you really should leave some room <laughs> for yeah. Rich's Thank dish. You. Here we go. Thank you. That beef is sensational. Mm. Thank you so much for having us here at Hoggett Kitchen. Oh, yeah, pleasure. Thoroughly Cheers. enjoyed it, guys. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you. Rich. Thank you. So we're going to reinvent the apple and berry crumble. It's going to be wheat-free, lactose-free and gluten-free. I hope it's still goddamn delicious. Oh, have faith, Karen. Have faith. <laughs> Tell me about what's in the crumble mix. OK, so we've got some ground oats, we've got some macadamia, almond, cashew, mm -hmm. and for a little bit of fruit, dried cherries, some dates, a little bit of white wings gluten-free flour. So you've still got a fat component going in because what makes up a great crumble is the mix of sugar, mm. butter, and then the oats and a little flour. So you're replacing the sugar with some dried fruit. Fruits. I think that's a genius idea. What are you using for the fat component? Because we really need that crumble to... It's be... a little bit of... We're going to use 200 grams of vegan butter. Okay. So that's and, made... and a little coconut oil. I and a little can... coconut oil, yeah. Okay, this is going to be great. You want to chop up that, and I'll chop up these. The secret to a crumble for me is to have a little bit of texture in it, rather than it all being one sort of even crumb mm. with that unevenness. We'll put in 150 grams of the oat flour, two tablespoons of white wings flour itself, and I'll just rub this. Yep, yeah. you do that. I'll get some dried fruit. So when you say rub, you're just literally breaking the vegan butter through the oat mix, and it should be sticky and uneven. Do you want to give me the cherries? Do you want to have a date? Uh, no, thanks. Okay. I'm free on Friday. <laughs> there we are. Gorgeous. Gorgeous. OK, I'm going to leave these dates quite chunky, I think. Can I have a, a few of those too, yep. please? I've just popped the almonds in and I'll follow in, because I've got the dirty hands, so yep. I'll follow in with the cashews and the macadamias. Now, you could use any choice nut you like. Mm -hmm. yeah. We've got three going on here because we're showing off. <laughs> And I think just a slight drizzle of the coconut oil. See how that's just a little dry there? Yep. That's it. What a great combination. How many apples are we adding? Two will do. Two will do. We've got some blackberries, blueberries and raspberries. A couple of handfuls of each. It's probably close to a punnet of each, actually. Yeah. I've also got a handful of strawberries, because we're going all the way with this crumble. It's a berry and apple crumble. The other unusual ingredient mm. I wanted to add was some orange. Have you had a roasted orange before? No. Yeah. Well, okay, well, I'm about to. Yes. <laughs> now for the apples. There you go. To sweeten the fruit slightly, I'm going to add a couple of tablespoons of maple syrup and about the juice of half an orange. This is the juice of one orange, so we'll just go with half. Then we'll mix this together. So just tossing the fruit quite gently. I don't want to squash it too much. Yeah, now you've got this natural urge to just pile everything in the middle, but I'm going to push some of the apples and the orange and the berries to the side mm. because we want to see it when they finish cooking. OK. Where yeah, do you want? so through here. Through there. The crumble gully. The crumble gully. <laughs> That's it. Well, that's looking just divine. All the magic happens in the oven for a crumble. 
I reckon it'll take half an hour, 180 degrees. Always put a tray underneath because the juices can overflow. We don't want to mess up the oven. There we are. So pop it in, Rich. Okay. You open the door, I'll put it in. So why don't we just sneak from this corner here? Yeah. Look at the rich colour. What about that hold? It's hot. Is it hot? By the way, it's just come out of the oven. Mmm. Delicious. A divine apple and berry nut crumble. That's low lactose, low gluten, and damn right fabulous. Mm. Karen. Yes. My childhood memory of crumble was all about the crumble, but then it was also a little bit about the custard. Well, I mean, Rich, I just happen to have some Liddell's lactose-free custard right here. Would you like to try? I would love to. Say Ooh. when. When. Okay. I'm really hoping that it's going to bring those memories home for you, Rich. <laughs>